Hello everyone, this is Benny Hills, back with another theory video, and today we will be talking about the art of counterspells. This is a, an old classic, counterspells are as old as the game itself, and a very, very important staple of blue control decks, and therefore of my magic career. I've definitely played a lot of counterspells in my day. And similarly to cantrips, when you think about how best to use counterspells, you need to think about the role they're playing in your deck. So, there's three different roles that counterspells play. First of all, there's the role of counterspells in combo and aggro decks. And in that case, the goal is to delay your opponent and buy you time to find your combo. So you don't actually really care about answering their threats in a permanent way. Your goal is just to, like, not die to them. And so this is the sort of situation where a counterspell like Remand is ideal. Because you sort of get to advance your own game plan by drawing a card. You draw towards your combo pieces. They still have their card, but you don't actually care about answering their card that much. You just want to be progressing your own game plan. So when you are playing a proactive deck the, and the goal of counterspells is just to buy you time, that really changes the way you use them. You're going to not really save them basically ever. You're just going to fire them off when you get the chance for the most part and try and progress your game plan as much as possible. More interesting, as is usually the case, is the role of counterspells in control decks. And so here, there's two main ways that counterspells are used. First of all, sometimes you can use counterspells like on curve early on as just an another piece of interaction. And in this case, they're very similar to a removal spell or something like that. The perfect example of this is Sensor in Pioneer. You're not playing Sensor because you really want to be able to deal with your opponent's like game-breaking threat. You just do that because it's a cheap piece of on curve interaction that can help you from falling behind. So. When, and, and, you know, another example is Manalik in Modern. Like, that's not really your, like, turn 8 counterspell for their big haymaker. It's a way to not fall behind. And so, that's a counterspell that you're okay with casting. Again, like, you're not going to be as selective when you're playing your sensor. You're going to sort of censor most spells when you get the chance. Not always. Like, sometimes, if you're pretty sure that, you know, they type out on turn 2 and you're not that scared of their 2-drop, but you think they might play 3-drop. Like, say, you're playing against... Jeskai Luka, and they play Birth of Melitus on turn two. You could censor that, but like maybe you want to save it for their Teferi Time Reveler on turn three. That that makes sense. But usually, when you can censor something, you're going to do it. And so that's again like you need to keep in mind: censor is not played for like to be a major piece of interaction with their key card. So you can use it a little bit less sparingly and sort of just cast it when you can. But the most important use of counterspell is a counterspell that you play because you want it to be, like, slam the door shut. Like, they have a card that you can't really answer that well otherwise, but a counterspell does answer it. So you play a counterspell specifically to deal with that threat. And you really want to avoid uh, casting your counterspell on small, like, intermediate threats that are just not really going to completely reshape the game and save your counterspell for this, like, card. So think about Dovin's Veto or, sen or uh, Ceremonious Rejection against Tron. Like... Usually you want to counter their Karn Liberated with that. You're not going to counter their Chromatic Star. And, I mean, sometimes you might want to counter an Ancient Stirring or an Expedition Map, but in general, like, you're using these big counter spells against their big spells. And you really want to be sparing and save them for when, you, for when they're playing spells that you really can't deal with very effectively with other cards in your deck. So having gone through the three main roles that counter spells can play, let's look at a couple of specific things you should be thinking about when you're deciding if you want to counter a spell. So we're assuming here that you have one counter spell. If you have like five counter spells, you can basically counter anything. Um, but let's we're assuming you have one counter spell and you have managed to cast it, and your opponent is playing some threat. So the first thing to keep in mind is that your current status in the game influences deeply what you can afford to play around. So if you're really ahead, you can basically save your cryptic command to counter only an absolutely backbreaking card. So you can let things resolve that might be really good and like usually would be an easy counter, but you can really afford to play around only the most extreme cards. This is a big thing in Legacy, where, like, the ideal control game, you end the game with a Force of Will and a blue card in your hand, and you had it as, like, a sort of fail-safe option throughout the whole game, but you never needed to use it because you could always answer it with other cards. So, yeah, again, when you're really far ahead, you can afford to play around a lot and sort of think, like, what's the worst-case scenario? Like, I draw a couple bricks, they draw, like, these two cards in a row... Can I beat that? Like, and if so, what am I saving my counterspell for? Conversely, if you're pretty far behind, you basically just counter what you can counter. And like, yeah, may, like, you know, you're playing against Tron, they play Worm Coil that like will kill you sort of quickly. And like, 
you might just have to counter it anyways because you can't really play around them top decking Karn off the top because no matter what, if they top deck Karn, you're going to lose. Like, you could save your counter spell and then die to the Worm Coil and be ready against their Karn or just counter the Worm Coil and hope they don't draw the Karn. And in this situation, you're probably losing either way, but you're definitely losing if you play around them having good top decks. And so you sort of have to just assume they don't have it, play like they're not going to top deck it, and beat the cards that you know they have access to. Another consideration is how much of a burden it is to hold up mana. So if you're playing basically a draw-go deck, you don't really, like, how much mana you have open isn't that much of a consideration, because you're just assuming every turn you'll have access to almost all of your mana, so it's not a great burden to be holding up two blue mana for your counter spell consistently. But, if you're playing a sort of hybrid deck that has some tap-out elements and some counter spells, then it can be a little bit more costly. Like, say you have a Jace the Mind Sculptor you want to play, and you have a counter spell in your hand, you know, you pass on turn three, hold up your counter spell. They play something like maybe you can beat, but you want to play your Jace the next turn. So, like, you could just not play your Jace next turn and continue holding up counter spell, or you could let it resolve and then play your Jace the Mind Sculptor and then have counter spell the turn after. But in this case, it's a real cost because you are losing a lot by not using your mana on this turn because you want to use it next turn as well. And so, it's very important to think about how much it hurts you to be holding up mana to use counter spells on future turns if you don't counter the spell this turn. And so, in the very late game, this isn't that much of a consideration because you'll probably have enough mana to play your Jace and hold up counter spell. But there's a very long medium, like middle section of the game where it is very costly to hold up mana. And so you need to sort of weigh the pros and cons of saving your counter spell for a more relevant threat versus losing the tempo of not being able to tap those blue mana on your turn consistently throughout the game. Another thing that determines how bad it is to not use your counter spell mana is if you have other instant speed threats. So this is what makes cards like Shark Typhoon and Factor Fiction so powerful, because you can hold up counter magic, and then if they don't cast a spell that you need to counter, you can just use your mana to advance your game plan in another way. And next turn, you can just hold up counter spells again, and once again, use your mana for something else if they don't make you do it. This also makes it very hard for your opponent to play around your counter spells, because if your only instant speed cards are counters, and they see you're holding up mana, they can just not cast a spell and make you waste all your mana. But, you can't really play around an opponent that could be conceivably holding up Factor Fiction or Cryptic Command, because either way, they're likely to have a good use for that 4 mana. So, your opponent sort of just has to jam, and you can, you know, make it a lot harder for them to play around your spells. Next, I'm going to talk about counter spells versus other forms of interaction like removal spells. So, first I'll go through the pros of counter spells. First of all, they often trade up on mana. So, it's not very, I mean, it depends on the format. Um, I mean, Force of Will almost always trades up on mana. But, like, in modern, you, it's pretty common that you can mana leak something like, um, you know, a Jace the Mind Sculptor, or a Primeval Titan, or something like that, or a Karn Liberated. So, Removal spells can do this too, but counter spells very frequently can trade up on mana very well. Secondly, they beat into the battlefield effects and like sort of immediate impact effects. So if your opponent casts to fairy hero of Dominaria and you have a hero's downfall, they immediately draw a card and get to untap two mana and then you kill it. But with a counter spell, you can deal with it before they get any of the benefit from it. This isn't always the case. Some cards have cast triggers, but in general, counter spells can sort of soak up more of the value of a card than a removal spell can. So that's a pretty strong advantage. Next, they're more versatile. So some removal spells just say destroy target permanent, but that's pretty rare. Uh, a flexible removal spell can hit a creature or a planeswalker, but a counter spell can hit a creature, a planeswalker, an instant of sorcery, artifact, enchantment. It can just hit a lot more cards. Obviously, like a negate can't hit a creature, but in general, your spells will be able to deal with a wider array, array of threats when they're counter spells than if they're removal spells. Another advantage is it sort of beats future threats, unlike something like a discard spell. So the classic problem with Jund is you thought sees them, take their spell, they have nothing going, and then they top deck something that you can't beat. And so counter spells not only can deal with the cards in their hand, but they can also deal with potential future top decks if you're in a situation where you can afford to hold your counter spells. So that's a pretty big advantage over what people call more proactive uh, inter disruption, like discard spells. And then finally, counter spells sort of strike fear to the heart of the opponent, like other cards can't really do. And so there's a lot of situations where you can generate tempo with nothing just by bluffing a counter spell. A very common line in formats with shock lands is you can go like shock with hallowed fountain pass, holding up three mana, including a couple blue, and 
no opponent wants to just jam their big haymaker into your counter spell. So they're very likely to either, you know, maybe wait until they can play two threats in one turn or wait until they can thought seize plus play a threat. Or maybe even just, you know, play a smaller threat that is a little bit less scary. And so that's a huge advantage that you can really exploit with counter spells. So I really recommend often, if you're especially if you're playing a matchup where your life total isn't super relevant, holding your shock lines until turns where you want to bluff a counter spell. One thing to keep in mind is if you bluff a counter spell and then they play around it and then you draw a counter spell, it's pretty awkward because you sort of just like your bluff worked, but then it actually just gave them information. So that's something to keep in mind. But in general, I do think it's a really powerful play to bluff counter spells sometimes. And like if your opponent's in a position where they really need to go for it or they will lose, like bluffing doesn't do too much when you have like Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, and Jace the Mind Sculptor in play because just waiting will not work for your opponent. They, like, bluffing won't accomplish much there because they are sort of priced into playing their spell, even though they think you might have a counter. But if you're sort of at parity, or maybe your opponent's a little bit ahead, you can really use bluffs effectively and buy time to draw into your answers. That being said, it's not all roses. There there are downsides to counter spells as opposed to other forms of removal, so or interaction more generally. You have to have it at the right time. So... You really need to have your mana up and the card in hand when they cast their big spell. And if you don't, it can be pretty easy to fall behind. Counter spells when you're behind on board are very, very bad because they don't interact with the board. And you really have to have them at the right moment. So when you're ahead, counter spells are amazing. When you're even, counter spells are fine. But when you're behind, they are pretty bad. So you need to build your deck with that in mind. And you need to have some ways to catch back up if your counter spells can't get the job done. That's why board sweeper effects are so effective in counter spell decks because. You can sort of let your opponent develop their board in the first couple turns, slam your verdict on turn four, and then for the rest of the game, have up counter spells to prevent yourself from falling behind again. They're also easier to play around. Um, your opponent can sort of wait until they have a good window um, and sort of get your get their threats down then, whereas like you can sort of deal with your... Sorry, I need to think of how to say this. Whereas you're going to have your removal spell and you're going to be able to kill their thing whenever they do get it down. So like, you know, you can tap out for your planeswalker and if you have a removal spell in hand, they tap out for their follow up and then you can removal spell their thing. Whereas if your answer is a counter spell, you lost your window and you won't be able to use that counter spell effectively. This is why Teferi Hero of Dominaria is so good because you can resolve it and then still have mana for counter spells. Uh, but that's more of a Teferi being good thing than a counter spell being good because most threats won't let you do that as effectively. Another thing is removal spells can get two for one sometimes. So say your opponent taps out for Splinter Twin on their Deceiver X Arc, boom, Doom Blade. You just got a two for one. Whereas if your answer was a counter spell, it's just a one for one. Likewise, if you're playing against the sort of the SRAM decks that put a bunch of auras on a creature, a removal spell can get a two for one or three for one or five for one that way too, in a way that counter spells can't always do. Counter spells can sometimes do this. Say your opponent goes and a turn Desperate Ritual, Gifts Ungiven, and you counter the gifts, you do get a two-for-one there, but it's more common that you can get a two-for-one with a removal spell than with a counter spell, unless you're playing a format like Vintage or Vintage Cube, where it's common that opponents will put a bunch of eggs into one basket and really rely on one huge spell to resolve to recoup that card disadvantage. Counter spells are also worse against low-to-the-ground decks. Um, if, you have, if you're playing against a Lurus deck and you have a three-mana counter spell, that won't really go super well for you because all of their cards are just going under you and like you don't have interaction until turn three and by then it's often too late. So removal spells are much better there because you can deal with the threats that they've already resolved. There's a couple other considerations that you should think about when you're considering uh, counter spells versus removal spells or other forms of interaction. First of all, there's some cards that are hexproof and so counter spells are much, much better against these. And there's other cards that can't be countered and removal spells are better against those. So Consider the format and consider the card, the threats you think you'll be playing against, in particular the threats you're most concerned about. So if you expect to see a lot of uh, the six men and Niv-Mizzet, then um, you might want removal spells because that card can't be countered. But if instead you think you're going to be playing against a lot of um, witch stalkers, then you want to use counter spells because your, your removal spells won't be particularly effective. Next, you need to think about what card types you're most worried about. So most commonly it's planeswalkers these days, and that's why I think there are an increasing number of planeswalk or removal spells can hit planeswalkers in addition to creatures like murderous rider and eliminate. But if you're more worried about enchantments, like say you're saying 
say you're playing against you're playing a black red deck that has a lot of removal spells and your opponent hard casts a shark typhoon that's very very hard for you to deal with because your removal spells can't hit enchantments so if you're worried about shark typhoon then you might want to lean more on counter magic and splash blue for some counter spells that can deal with shark typhoon but if you're mostly just worried about creatures and planeswalkers then black red will be totally fine and your removal spells will be quite nice Next, both removal spells and counterspells scale with the quality of the card you're playing against, which is why counterspell is such a great card in Vintage Cube, because there's some really, really powerful cards that you need to have answers to, and removal spells just often don't get the job done. But that being said, a removal spell is still good. Like, if you have a go for the throat, it'll usually get you more value in a game of Vintage Cube than it will in a game of Ixalan Limited. And that's just because, I mean, yeah, you can counter a 3-3 three, three for 3, or you can Doom Blade a 3-3 three, three for 3, and both of those are fine, like, you do need to deal with that eventually, I guess. But they're much more effective against Consecrated Sphinx. And so, both Counterspells and Removal Spells scale with the power of the cards you're answering with them, but Counterspells scale even more because they are more likely to be able to deal with End of the Battlefield effects, or, you know, Dies effects, or other things that make threats sticky and good against Removal Spells. So those are some thoughts about counter spells um, in a variety of formats. So just a quick recap. There's a couple things to consider when you're building your deck. What, what's the role of counter spells? Is it to buy you time? Is it to help you not fall behind and deal with threats on curve? Or is it to be your way to slam the door and deal with their threats that are really, really hard for you to answer otherwise? That really changes the way you use them. Secondly, is it a big burden for you to be holding up mana? You know, this could be if you have a bunch of lands, then it's not. If you're limited on blue mana then it is a burden to hold up counter spells. If you have mostly instants, then it's less of a burden. And if you have ways to advance your game plan other than casting counter spells, it's less of a burden. So if you're playing a bunch of counter spells, that really makes instant speed cards go up in value a lot. Whereas if you are playing mostly a tap out control deck that is playing a couple counter spells to like deal with very specific cards, then you don't really care about having instant speed threats and you're okay with tapping out more. And then there's you holding up counter magic on the key turns when your opponent might have that primeval titan or something like that finally you need to think about the cards that you're most concerned with answering when you're weighing whether to play counter spells or removal spells and think about first of all if counter spells can deal with the threats more cleanly because of into the battlefield effects or other things and secondly if you're going to be usually killing things that are very cheap and if you are then removal spells are generally better because they can deal with the board that has already been developed so that's some thoughts on counter spells. I hope that was helpful. Let me know if you have any more specific comments in the uh, in, let me know if you have any more specific questions in the comments, um, or if there's specific counter spells you want me to discuss. I mean, there's some counter spells like Cryptic Command that do far more than just counter spells, and that's a whole nother video. I could make an entire video just on the card Cryptic Command. Um, I can also do sort of more specific pros and cons of Logic Knot versus Mana Leak versus Remand versus Dovin's Veto at some point, if you'd like. But this is sort of more a broad overview of counter spells generally and sort of the role they play in your deck and uh, how you want to use them and how conservatively you want to be. So thank you so much for watching. I haven't really made this explicit play like a lot of YouTubers do, but I would really appreciate if you would like and subscribe. It helps me with the YouTube algorithm to let my videos be shown to more people, and I also really would like to build up my subscriber community and um, just get a big community where we can talk about these things and I can sort of poll you to find out what sort of videos you'd like to see the most. Um, yeah, but thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next and I'll definitely keep the theory videos coming. See you next time.